There we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another week of good nature. Um, all kinds of things are happening. Let me tell you, every time I turn around, there's either, a, oh, look at that, it's back, or I haven't seen this before. Let's do some investigating. So tonight's program is a little bit of both of those. Um, and uh, hope you enjoy it. Let's get started. Let's see. Where's our screen share? There we go. All right, enough of that. Let's jump into the thing that caught my eye. Uh, actually, a couple of weeks ago, I saw one right outside my front door. And I was so excited because um, this is a, a phenomenon that, that is sometimes overlooked or it's looked upon with disgust because let's be honest, what does it actually look like? It looks like a Lugiana plant. Um, but it's actually the uh, a group of bugs we call uh, the spittle bugs. And uh, as it turns out, there's there's a whole bunch of different types of spittle bugs that um, cause a similar sort of um, action on plants that can happen. Uh, herbaceous plants, uh, there's even some that uh, occur on uh, saplings. Uh, they can be on uh, crops. They can be on ornamental plants. Um, some of them follow certain plant families, some of them don't. Um, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's really hard to identify these much beyond um, the, uh, the super family. Uh, this though is what happens if we just accept the spittle bug for what it is, which is a, a cool bug that lives amongst the bubbles. Um, uh, you can take your finger, you can swipe into its little castle that it's made on the plant stem and um, you can get a, an up close look at uh, the little larvae that's inside. Now keep in mind, this is the, the immature version of these bugs. <clears throat> they, they do grow up and turn into uh, little leaf hoppers. Here it is, this is without the spittle. And I, I was, used to be kind of hesitant to do this because I thought, oh my goodness, it's it worked so hard to create its little uh, of, of spittle. Um, I don't wanna, disturb all of its hard work. But as it turns out, these things are kind of mobile and sometimes they migrate from bubble house to bubble house. And if you're lucky, you can even find uh, a, a wad of bubbles that has multiple spittle bug larvae in it. Um, now, uh, this is what I'm talking about. When we talk about lots of different kinds, uh, Bug Guide has some uh, pretty comprehensive sections, but again, this is only going down to family. There's three uh, large families within that uh, super family. If you really want to get into it, there's a, a neat, um, it's actually, a, uh, you can get it online as a PDF. This uh, book here on the left, um, there's a whole, this whole part 10 is all about spittle bugs. Uh, you can learn about their life cycle and their habits and uh, what eats them, which curiously enough is not really all that many things. Um, uh, that, that house of bubbles is really effective as a deterrent to predators. And so even though if we look back again at this little larva, it's, uh, it's soft bodied, but um, there's not a lot of things that dare go after it. Um, now to make that house, I wished I'd been able to get some, uh, some action photos of the, uh, the spittle uh, bug uh, in action. What they do, um, these are, are true bugs. They have a, a piercing and sucking mouth part. And what they do is they feed on um, <clears throat> not the phloem part of the plant, which if you remember your plant parts or uh, have heard about plants parts before, the phloem is the part that moves the food around inside the plant. Um, the xylem moves the water around. So it's, it's a... Um, it's a very uh, diluted source of nourishment for this bug. So uh, when they take a lot of fluid in, um, 
to derive the nutrients that they need, they also have to expel a lot of fluid. And that's where this, uh, this bubble action gets started as the, uh, the insect expels the fluid, it turns it up with its back legs, uh, kind of like this, the same action that you'd get, say, if you were whisking, uh, say, egg whites um, to make a, a meringue. Those bubbles the form and uh, the insect lives inside quite safely um, until, you know, curious naturalists come along and dig them out. Um, here's the secret. Uh, if we look underneath the spittle bug, here's what allows them to do what they do. Here's that, uh, that mouth part I was talking about. It just, as we see with our other true bugs that, um, that folds down against the, uh, the bottom of the insect, and then they can swing it out and slurp away. They insert it into the, uh, the plant tissues and they slurp. Um, these hind legs uh, work, as I said, in a churning motion and they create the bubbles that we see here. Um, this whole thing about them not being vulnerable to predators I thought was so interesting because they, um, uh, the, the females, in, in, when you, you think of you know, insects laying eggs, it's not like a chicken or a duck where they lay an egg a day. Um, they'll crank out usually dozens and you know, some insects are capable of hundreds. There's a few that are capable of thousands. Um, the uh, parents, uh, the females of these spittle bugs, they about 35 to 50 eggs is all they have to produce because they're just not that vulnerable to, um, to being eaten. So I thought that was kind of interesting. And um, people have asked me, uh, you know, are they harmful to plants? In fact, a couple of people wrote me and said, gee, you know, every time I saw that, I thought it meant the plant had a leak and there was a problem and the plant was dying. I never realized there was an insect inside of there. Um, they can have some economic impact depending on the plants that they're feeding on. Um, a large infestation could cause damage to say uh, uh, crops, but, um, Around here, we mostly see them in our natural areas, um, and they they don't severely impact the plant's ability to grow. So, um, <clears throat> as you're out and about, keep your eyes open for big wads of bubbles hanging off of plants. And if you dare, go ahead and, and swipe into them, and maybe you can find yourself a little baby spittle bug too. Now, as I was uh, walking around um, looking for spittle bugs. I also was reminded uh, of an insect that uh, I puzzled over for quite a while when I first discovered it several years ago because it, it had me confused. Um, it's this little creature right here over on the right side of uh, the screen. Now, it looks like a caterpillar, right? But let's look a little closer. And um, it still looks kind of caterpillar-like, but um, it, not quite a caterpillar, right? Is, is your brain working the same way mine does? It's like, you know, there's, there's something that's not quite right here. Well, if you look at the side and the underside of this insect, you see that there are no prolegs. Yeah. So um, what the heck are prolegs? Um, the uh, insect that we're looking at, which as you saw there, was the goldenrod leaf beetle. Um, is actually, it's a beetle larva. Beetle larvae don't have prolegs, but uh, the larvae of butterflies and moths, better known as caterpillars, do. Um, this was a uh, uh, modern caterpillar that was uh, munching on some swamp milkweed out at uh, Otter Creek Bend last summer. See how there's one, two, three, four, and then back here is another pair, five little sets of pro legs, in addition to the six legs that the, the caterpillar will retain as an adult. Um, here we can see it really well on this polyphemus caterpillar. This was at the Nature Center a couple of years ago. One, two, three, four, and again, the fifth set of pro legs here on the back um, fir help firmly anchor this insect as it's feeding. And then one, two, three, four, five, six of the, uh, the permanent insect legs that it will retain as an adult. Um, we can see it here too. This is called a um, uh, arches, uh, got hitched arch 
uh, moth, I believe. I get a hard time identifying this one, uh, but they were all over our natural area a couple of years ago. Hitched arches or arched hinges. I'll have, to, if, if you're really curious about it, I can look it up for you. But um, I threw the picture in because you can see both the pro legs here, one, two, three, four, and then these anchors on the back, and then one, two, three sets of legs up front. That up and down shows us that it belongs to the lepidopterans, the butterflies, and the moths. However, there's another group of insects that um, also have pro legs, and these are the sawflies. Um, the thing with sawflies, they just look for all the world like caterpillars, don't they? Um, there's a few things to look for. If you if you've, are getting that vibe that it's caterpillar, but it's not a caterpillar, um, they uh, look at the pro legs because a sawfly is going to have six or more pairs. So let's check here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven on this one. One, two, three, four, this one's kind of a blurry flower. Five, six, seven on this one. These, we can't really see at all. This was a, uh, on uh, an elderberry in my backyard last year and I counted seven pairs on it as well, but of course it wouldn't pose nicely so that I could get a decent picture of it. But you can see the uh, three pairs of legs that it will retain as an adult sawfly. Um, again, if you're not sure if it's a caterpillar or a sawfly, you know, a lot of caterpillars, are like I'm thinking like of sphinx moth caterpillars, you disturb them and they rear their heads up. Well, sawflies rear their rear ends up. Uh, when they're agitated. So that's another thing you can check for. And then if you see just a massive amount of what looks like caterpillars, it, it could be say, um, it, we've got a, a few caterpillars around here that uh, hang out in groups. A lot of them tend to be fuzzy. I'm thinking of like our tent caterpillars um, and uh, so, yeah, the walnut moth caterpillars, they tend to hang out in groups too. Um, but when you see a, a lot of what looks like caterpillars and then they raise their little butts up in the air, you're looking at sawflies. So what the heck are sawflies? Um, you know, there's a couple of really nice, nicely uh, and, and fun to read websites uh, that are, are out there in cyberspace. One is the bug lady. She's at uh, UW-Milwaukee and um, she did a nice explanation of what soft lies are way back in 2009, but it's still all of her writing is accessible. I like the way she writes in the third person and she calls herself the bug lady. Um, very readable, very interesting, very thorough explanations. Uh, another great website is Bug Eric. Uh, this is Eric Eaton. Uh, if you hang out at all on bugguide.net, you'll see his name a lot. Um, he's called upon to help identify different types of insects. Uh, well, he has his own blog um, called Bug Eric, and people can write in with questions. Um, and then he also does, uh, I don't know if it's every week or um, how often he posts, but um, he makes lots of cool finds. And he's got a new book out um, all about wasps. Um, and I love how he calls them a misunderstood insect because that's exactly what wasps are. Well, as it turns out, sawflies are actually in the uh, order Hymenoptera, which includes the bees and wasps and um, ants and sawflies too. Another name for the sawfly is the wood wasp. They have that, that very obvious larval stage where they're feeding on plants. And then as adults, um, they often also will feed on plants. And then will also, the female has a very obvious um, ovipositor or uh, egg depositing gadget that sticks off the end of her body. It looks like a giant stinger. It's not, they don't sting, but she uses that to insert into uh, plant stems um, or uh, woody stems too, to uh, lay her eggs and uh, have those little caterpillar-like larvae hatch. Um, you might recognize the picture here. That's a, uh, an elm sawfly. Uh, Longtime good natured our viewers might uh, recall seeing this male elm sawfly that was found here in St. Charles uh, not quite a year ago. So these are out there. They're really cool. Um, but uh, <laughs> this was a very long tangent to get back to this little thing that I saw, this uh, goldenrod leaf. Uh, beetle larva. Let's watch. That's a pretty cool defense. 
it wiggles its little bottom around uh, when it's disturbed. Um, and you can see that, yes, it is feeding on goldenrod. Um, and there's, there was, there was a lot of these around. And uh, check out that camera. <laughs> All right, I think we've seen enough. Um, you might think, well, gosh, you know, it's going to eat all the goldenrod. Well, it turns out there's there's lots of different kinds um, uh, of uh, these goldenrod leaf beetles, um, and the specific name kind of depends on the plant you find them on. Uh, around here, we have a lot of Canada goldenrod. Uh, in fact, um, uh, here I'll show you. This is uh, the Hickory Knolls natural area. Um, Canada goldenrod uh, is one of the plants that our natural areas crew will try to remove uh, because it, it uh, will proliferate in an area. Um, but there's there's so much of it that sometimes having something like the goldenrod leaf beetle around uh, is going to help us control it. But this is what the adult insect looks like. So that little tiny, almost caterpillar looking like they're, they're, a, they're a deep, like a, a very deep navy blue. It's kind of metallic looking. Um, they, uh, this is the adults um, that will actually be appearing probably in about um, a month or so. We're into June, so maybe as we get into July, we'll start to see these adults. They look a lot like a lot of other um, leaf beetles that we have in this area. The identifier for this particular type, uh, the canadensis, which is the same name as our um, Canada goldenrod um, is this square on the back of the head. Um, there's different variations on the, these markings here on the, uh, the leaf beetle. But um, the, uh, the females, uh, the, the adults are going to be emerging um, in midsummer. They will continue to feed on the plant themselves. Um, and then they will uh, lay eggs, which overwinter, the eggs have to get cold or they won't hatch. And then um, they come out again in spring. They go through only three development phases or instars uh, before they pupate. Um, and you think, wow, you know, there, there were just so many out there on, on these goldenrod plants. Do they have any predators? Well, this is not for uh, the canadensis larvae. These were two other species that occur in New York, but it turns out that they are targeted by a number of um, uh, insects. Hemiptera are, are true bugs. Uh, we've got some um, assassin bugs, uh, Rebutia day, that um, will go after these uh, beetles and the larva quite commonly. There's some beetles, the coleopterus, that will go after um, Hymenoptera would be our uh, predatory wasps around India. That's a, um, that's a type of uh, crab spider that you know, they hang out on golden rock. They're going to eat these beetles and larvae as well. Uh, there's some parasitoids, which um, the uh, tachinid flies are flies that will lay their eggs in the larvae. Uh, those will actually kill their hosts. Um, so they're they're pretty common. Um, and then there's also a nematode parasite that lives on the beetles as well. So um, <clears throat> I didn't, I was trying to see if I could find uh, you know, evidence or, or records of birds or other uh, creatures that might, uh, you know, things with vertebrae <laughs> that might want to feed on these. I didn't see any record of that, but that doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Um, and I might try a few experiments with some larvae because like I said, they are just everywhere right now. <laughs> um, Tyrabda is the uh, the genus name, and then again the um, the larvae are really hard to distinguish by looking at them. In fact, they they say it's impossible to tell them apart. But you can tell what species you're looking at by the plant that you're finding them on. So that's what's up in the world of goldenrod beetles. And again, when you've got fields of goldenrod like this, you know you're going to have a lot of beetles out there too. So uh, the other night I was letting the dogs out and as I often do, I'll go out and step out on the deck with them and make sure they behave themselves. And uh, it gives me a great chance to see what's uh, coming around the porch light. And I saw this guy and my first instinct was, my goodness, it's, it's a lightning bug, but it's kind of early for lightning bugs. This, 
I saw this um, just about a week ago. Yeah, lightning bugs in our area, fireflies, they tend to come out as we get into June. Uh, they peak right around the 4th of July. Uh, right now, most of them are pupating in the soil. They're either still in their larval stage in the soil or they're pupating. Um, I haven't seen any uh, lightning bugs lighting up yet. If you have and you want to let us know in the comments, feel free. Um, my experience, uh, your experience may vary, but I haven't seen any yet. <laughs> Uh, plus, this wasn't a lightning bug. Um, here's another picture. Um, and what this is, is a yellow-necked soldier beetle. Uh, now, why isn't it a lightning bug? Well, let's do a little side-by-side -side comparison here. Lightning bugs have, whoops, eh. Lightning bugs have what we call a pronotum. A lot of beetles have this. It's like a shield that covers the thorax and part of the head. Sometimes the lightning bug's head will kind of retreat underneath this uh, pronotum and uh, you just this piece here actually looks like it's the head. But here you can see um, he's or she, I forget. I think this was the female, uh, this particular pair I was watching. Um, you can see her eyes here uh, and her antennae. Um, the antennae are a little bit uh, different shaped, a little bit longer. Um, on the soldier beetle. And look, it has a neck. It doesn't have a pronotum. So there's this uh, structure here uh, where the thorax is um, that they call a neck. Um, and it's, it's an easy way to tell the two apart. Um, soldier beetles are uh, usually uh, predators. They eat um, other bugs. They'll sometimes sip on nectar and things like that. There's some debate uh, in the coleopterists in the world of what constitutes an adult firefly diet. Um, there are some we know that, that do prey on other lightning bugs, but um, mostly uh, they, they sip nectar. They only last a couple of weeks as adults. Uh, I believe the soldier beetles have a slightly longer um, adult stage of life because they are known to feed on uh, other insects. So um, while we're in the world of weird things, um, I came across this photo and it's, it's a little bit out of sequence uh, in terms of our, our calendar, but um, uh, I'll show you in a few slides why I, I put it in this week's program. Uh, see that lump on that leaf? Now it's, it's crossing the mid vein of the leaf and that's uh, usually if you, if you have a gall on a leaf, it's, it's gonna be more centered on that leaf. Um, this, as it turns out, is a caterpillar. Uh, we found this up at, at uh, Camp Tomochichi Knolls, the, uh, the forest preserve that's up in Gilberts, Illinois. Um, this was, you can tell by the size of the leaf, this was not early uh, summer. This was, I believe in August, we found this caterpillar. And it's called a, a skiff moth caterpillar or skiff slug caterpillar. There's other, uh, the, the slug caterpillar uh, family is quite large and some of them are, are kind of um, dangerous. They've got some spines that uh, can give you uh, a reaction if you touch them. But uh, this one is, is pretty harmless. And I tell you, it has some of the best camouflage uh, I've ever seen because it looks so much like just a little leaf anomaly. Um, if we look a little closer at it here, I zoomed in um, on the left and then this is a photo on the right that shows what's going on underneath there. There is a head. Um, the legs are reduced. Um, this, it, it moves very uh, snail-like. It kind of glides along the surface of the leaf. Uh, it doesn't leave a mucus trail, at least none that I could see, but they're, they're just a really cool and very easily overlooked um, caterpillar that you can find later in the summer. Uh, on uh, look at all these different species. Um, again, this was on, a, a, I believe it was a red oak leaf that we found it on, but uh, I don't think it differentiates between wet, red and white. You can find them on both, plus um, hop hornbeam and uh, chestnut cherry, uh, willow. It's not terribly specific to a certain type of plant. Well, the reason I decided to put it in now um, is because the adults are flying. This is what the adult skiff moth looks like. Um, keep your eyes open. Um, they uh, do come to porch lights at night too. 
And um, if you start seeing moths like this, as we get into uh, later summertime, say August, uh, just do a little prowling around, um, look on the backs of some of the leaves you have uh, near your house or near where you are seeing the adults and see if you can find some uh, skiff moth caterpillars of your own. Pretty cool, huh? So um, I was trying to figure out how to approach this next segment and I thought, well, a Phoebe, a Peewee, a Kingbird, walk into a bar. <laughs> but I, I couldn't think of a good punchline for that. Um, although in one of my weird brain tangents, it did remind me of this. <laughs> I don't know if you saw this, this was making its rounds on Facebook a few months ago. A uh, priest, a rabbit, and a minister walk into a bar and the bartender asks the rabbit, what do you have? And the rabbit says, I don't know, I'm only here because of autocorrect. <laughs> <laughs> Made me laugh. Anyway, let's reel it in. Let's look at these three birds. I got to tell you, and you, those of you who know me know I'm not a great birder. And when we get into these um, groups of birds that have very slight um, distinguishing characteristics or to a, you know, uninitiated uh, eye seem like uh, very slight differences. It can be hard to tell, but these are three, I feel pretty confident telling apart. And I wanted to share with you um, how I do that. Um, let's start with the Phoebe. Um, let's, uh, first of all, um, this is a bird that, that um, you don't really have to get a good look at if you can see its outline and you can see its behavior. So this, um, this is some fish and wildlife uh, video that they um, took of a Phoebe perched up on top of a tree. Watch the tail. See that tail, Bob? This little fly catching bird has a very distinctive behavior. And if you see this general fly catcher shape, which is a, a slight uh, crest uh, up on top of the head. Um, and it's, it's kind of looking around for flies and, and lots of other insects too. But that tail bob is one really uh, distinctive way to tell a Phoebe. Um, so it's what I always look for because the color, sometimes they've got um, quite a bit of yellow on the lower, uh, on the belly. Um, sometimes there's, there's very little yellow present. Um, so there's some, some individual um, uh, variation that way, but that tail bob is a uh, definite giveaway for this bird. Now, um, it's also a bird that says its name. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. Hey, baby. Hey, So uh, if you hear that, so you know, sometimes um, it can get a little confusing around us sometimes because we also have chickadees, but they have a very melodic way of saying or what some people say is Phoebe that Phoebe. I've also heard springs here, um, but the, the Phoebe, it's, it's almost like they're a little bit angry uh, at you know, being disturbed. Phoebe. Maybe so, uh, if you see a bird bobbing its tail, maybe you hear that characteristic noise. It's saying its name is telling you. It wants you to know what it is. Uh, some other clues that you're looking at, Phoebe. These are a bird that makes a, a nest that's very um, similar in size to a robin's nest, uh, and they do use mud as robins do. But um, whereas robins incorporate a lot of um, plant material, uh, the grasses, the long stringy plant material. Uh, Phoebes will um, incorporate moss, especially around the outside. So mud and moss. There's other, other species that use moss too, but a cup the size of a robin's nest with um, uh, held together with mud and then uh, decorated with moss, uh, you're probably looking at a Phoebe nest. They also like to nest structures. We see this bird a lot in picnic cultures. Um, Johnson's Mound Forest Preserve will often have a Phoebe nest in it. Um, I know uh, older homes with, uh, that have woods nearby um, have hosted Phoebes as well. When I worked at Red Oak, we would always have a Phoebe nest um, on our garage uh, down at the Nature Center there in North Aurora. Uh, aside, um, to compare to these other two birds that we're 
we're talking about tonight, the, the peewee and the kingbird, uh, Phoebes do tend to come back earlier. I, I've seen them in March and I just, I worry about them because it's not that warm out sometimes and you know, the bugs are hard to find, but they're they're hardy little birds and they come back and they, they always seem to make a go of it. Um, so uh, keep that, all those things in mind. Uh, if you think you might be looking at a Phoebe. Um, now contrast that with this uh, somewhat smaller bird, uh, a little bit more, the, the vibe I get from a peewee is uh, grayer, um, smaller. And I, I tell you, I hear these birds more than I see them. They seem to like to hang out a little bit more. Uh, they'll, they, they will sit on a perch when they're, when they're catching insects, but uh, a lot of times they'll be up in the leaves. Um, they do tend to come back a little bit later. So whereas a Phoebe might be out when the leaves have yet to come out, the Flycatchers, by the time I'm hearing them, the, the trees are usually leafed out, these, these uh, eastern wood peewees. But um, listen to this bird too, because it's going to give you a clue. Peewee! It's a very drawn out sound. Peewee! Um, doesn't have the angry scolding sound that the Phoebe has. Even though Pee Wee and Phoebe prime, Pee Wee, they add that, that middle symbol to it. Um, I've never found um, the things to look for a uh, Phoebe, I'm sorry, a Pee Wee nest. Um, they're made of lichens and the pictures I've seen that they look like they're very hard to find. But uh, keep your ears open because I've heard a lot of Eastern wood peewees recently calling. So uh, if you're in the woods, uh, they like to be around the edges of woods because it's a lot easier to, to fly out and catch insects if you're not surrounded by branches. But um, look and listen for these guys as well. Now, um, this next bird, we've got a couple different video clips. This is the Eastern kingbird. So. Uh, First off, it's it's larger than the other two, and it's not likely to be sharing a lot of habitat. There might be a little crossover between it and a Phoebe if there's a Phoebe nesting on the, uh, you know, picnic shelter happens to be on the edge of an open field, but um, kingbirds like open space to forage in. I was watching one the other day um, coming and going from a post by the Fox River. It was taking advantage of some caddisflies that were uh, hatching, coming, emerging at the time. But on this bird, it's larger, it's darker, and it's got that white band um, along the tail there. Let's see if we can get this video to play. So I didn't include a recording of its sounds um, just because it, it's not something I use to help identify it. It's it's so distinctive with the uh, the the way it posts. This this is a very this is a classic kingbird type of pose. Middle of a field on something just a little bit taller than the surrounding vegetation. Um, dark head, white breast. There's a white bar on the tail. Uh, let's watch this bird too. You can see it's kind of looking around for insects. See that white bar at the bottom of the tail? That's a that's a big giveaway there. And then off it goes. Now, something that I have keep looking for and I have yet to find, um, kingbirds have a little um, red streak in the crown up here that, that they'll flash um, from time to time. Um, I'm always looking for it. I have yet to see it. I probably just need better binoculars, or maybe I needed better eyes, I don't know. But um, these were some old uh, color, well, one color plate and one black and white uh, plate from the late 1800s where they drew this bird. Uh, you can see in both instances, it's got insects in its mouth. And then um, in this drawing here, they included a picture of that uh, red flash up there on the crown. So keep your eyes open for it. Maybe you'll be lucky enough to spot it. So um, let's see, this was uh, about a week ago. No, I'm sorry. 
this was about a day ago. <laughs> Yesterday, I was over at Klein Creek Farm in Winfield, which is a really neat uh, place to visit. I had gone there um, a couple of years ago to prepare for uh, a program we were doing um, at Primrose Farm. Uh, Klein Creek Farm models farming practices from the late 1800s. Uh, so you can go, you can see uh, they've got draft horses there. I believe they've got Percheron. They're really big, big horses. Uh, they've got some um, uh, shorthorn, milking shorthorns. They've got um, Southdown sheep. They've got three or four different breeds of chickens. Uh, you can just walk around and, and you know interact with the animals, the staff there, the interpretive staff is really helpful. Well, as we were talking about, um, I believe it was the breeds of chickens that they have there. I happened to look down and what do I see? But wild chamomile, also known as pineapple weed. Um, this is one of my favorite um, late spring, early summer plants. If, if you crush those little flower heads there, you actually get a scent of pineapple, not, not like a, uh, you know, a, a pineapple from Hawaii, but more like, um, you know, those dum dum suckers, um, the pineapple flavored ones. That's what these uh, smell like. And you can make, uh, you can actually uh, use these for different things. I uh, can bet that uh, these two things, I've actually made the tea um, before. Uh, this is on my list of things to do while uh, these flowers are still available. The, the nice thing is that the, you, you don't really break many collecting laws because they don't grow in nice places. They grow um, in kind of waste areas or, um, along the sides of paths. It's not really high quality habitat where you tend to find them. So uh, taking, you know, a cup or two full isn't going to get you in any big trouble or anything. Um, you do want to make sure you rinse them off really well, though, uh, and make sure that they there's been no spraying in the areas where you're collecting. But for uh, the tea, all you have to do is, is collect the flowers and um, steep them in some boiling water. It's, it's, um, it's sweeter than actual chamomile tea. Um, I think it's, it's really refreshing. Sometimes I'll even uh, you know, cool it down and drink it as an iced tea, um, put a little honey in there tasty stuff. Uh, and then what I want to try this summer, um, I found this, uh, this recipe for uh, pineapple weed cordial, uh, vodka and pineapple weed uh, with a little honey to taste. Um, you actually you steep um, the, the majority of the uh, flowers that you collect, you, you steep those in the vodka and then you separately you steep some in the honey because the consistencies of those two liquids will extract flavors at different um, different flavor profiles will come out and then you once uh, you let them sit for a day or so then you you strain both of them and then you combine them so um, I'm gonna figure out a way to do this and we even figure out a way to, to sip some of this when we do next week's program we'll have to see how lucky I am in finding because uh, you need um, three quarters of a cup of uh, pineapple weed. So um, I have to find a, a good source. Probably won't be going to Klein Creek Farm uh, anytime soon again, but, um, and who knows, maybe I'll be running into you out there now that these secrets are out. But anyway, it's something that's happening right now. Even if you don't make either of these recipes, um, it is a, just a fun flower to, to just crush and sniff because it smells so good. Now, um, just like I'm not a great birder, I am also not a great plant person. So um, I have to thank uh, Kim Haig for helping us uh, a couple of weeks ago. Some nature nerds were out on a hike helping us sort out the difference between the leaves of two uh, fairly common plants that you might encounter in your hikes in this area. One is great angelica. And uh, you might be thinking, well, geez, Pam, you know, there, there's a huge difference. Um, there, great angelica is, is one of those can't miss types of flowers to identify, but it's not quite as easy before it blooms. Um, great angelica and um, cow parsnip. Uh, they will sometimes have overlapping habitat um, and they both have a, a, a pretty sturdy and, and quite large stalk to them. Um, and it can get a little confusing, but, but Kim pointed out if we um, you know, look at, here's again, this is great angelica. 
and here is cow parsnip. Uh, if we line them up side by side, we'll see the cow parsnip um, actually has uh, fewer uh, leaflets. Um, well, the leaflets it has are, are quite large. Um, as you go up the stem here, these uh, middle leaves are, uh, look at that, 20 inches long. We're, these, are, these are big plants. Um, and there's three divided into uh, three leaflets. Um, and on the right here, the great angelica has three to five leaflets. Um, and there, well, there's, there's like compound upon compound is what bipinate means. So it's just a, a much um, more finely divided leaf than what you see on cow parsnip. So um, once the, the flowers are blooming, then, then it's a, a whole lot easier. Um, cow parsnip gets a, a big white bloom to it. Um, great angelica gets, I always think of fireworks when I see like a, a bold green firework when I see the bloom of great angelica. Um, a great angelica too tends to tower over your head, um, depending on growing conditions. But sometimes those blooms are um, several, you know, say six feet or, or more in the air, whereas the cow parsnip tends to be maybe waist height, uh, sometimes shoulder height. Um, and cow parsnip is not the same as wild parsnip, um, which has a yellow blossom on it. Um, and then this parsley family, there's all kinds of twists and turns you can make. And again, uh, I'm not a botanist, so we're not gonna uh, explore uh, any more deeply this week, but um, cow parsnip and great angelica, they are now both starting to bloom, but if next year you, you know, rolls around early May and you see these giant leaves coming up out of the ground, look and see how those leaves are growing. Let's take one more look. Um, the uh, uh, three large leaflets on the uh, cow parsnip, whereas the, um, the multiple uh, divided uh, smaller leaflets on the great angelica. Um, I don't know if there's a good device you can implant uh, in your brains to help yourselves remember that. Maybe great angelica has a great number of divisions in the leaves. Um, uh, I don't know. Uh, and, and cow parsnip, uh, cow, uh, oh, you're on your own with that one. But there's the two leaves side by side. Keep that in mind for uh, next year when these plants are emerging. Now, um, this topic actually became even more topical. Um, Laura McKenzie, you sent me um, this screenshot um, last night. Um, this is a great example of, um, the bad side of social media. So look at, you know, let's, let's read it. It says, this is a post uh, in the infamous What's Happening uh, Facebook page. Um, this stuff is all over Delnor Woods. I'm sure other parks as well. It's giant hogweed. Do not let your kids touch it. The photo is a little girl that wanted to pick some. It sent her to the hospital, not St. Charles. The plant photo is Delnor. Okay, so again, social media, it's a holiday weekend, people are apt to be scrolling through um, and they see you know, a flower and they see Delnor Woods and they see a horribly blistered uh, little girl. And look at this, and this was um, 35 comments and 72 shares when, when uh, Laura forwarded this screenshot to me. It ballooned up to well over 100 comments, and one of those shares was to what's happening in Geneva, where, again, the citizenry was uh, up in arms. Uh, you know, how could we be allowing this plant to grow here? Um, well, the, the rest of the story was today we planned to do a little follow-up on it and uh, went to the, uh, the What's Happening pages and found that the posts were taken down. So I don't know if like, someone with a voice of reason came in and said, hey, look, people, this is not giant hogweed, which, by the way, I don't believe we have record of uh, that plant in Kane County, uh, at least not yet. Giant hogweed is a plant that um, has juices that are um, 
cause this reaction. It's, it's a plant that we call photoreactive. You can get a reaction too from cow parsnip and, and even uh, the, the uh, non-native wild parsnip that uh, I mentioned that has the, the yellow seed head to it. You wanna be very careful um, dealing with this stuff, um, like the, the, the yellow flowered wild parsnip. You wanna make sure that your, your skin is covered, you're wearing gloves, because um, once sunlight hits the plant juice on your um, arms like that, you can, you can get blisters like that. Um, but again, this was just an example um, of just how bad social media, and it's exactly uh, the epitome of this is how rumors get started. So um, again, on the left, that is Del Norwoods, and that is cow parsnip, uh, a native wildflower. And on the right, that is um, a Google image grab of somebody having a reaction to uh, giant hogweed, which uh, is not growing uh, at Del Norwoods or at any other park here in St. Charles. So with that, let's, uh, let's end on a happy note. Um, uh, yeah, I mentioned Klein Creek Farm. They've got a couple of there. Uh, we've actually uh, here in St. Charles, um, we've got a new arrival as well. Last Thursday, little baby Eleanor was born. Uh, she's a small Guernsey calf, uh, 40 pounds. Usually uh, calves are a little bit larger than that, but uh, she seems to be doing really well. Uh, and her mama, I'm not sure if that is peach. Um, I did think, uh, I didn't think to check and see who the, uh, the mama cow is, but um, if you get a chance, if you're out and about, uh, Primrose Farm is, is worth a visit too. Um, it's unlike Klein Creek, which targets the, uh, the late 1800s for its farming methods, Primrose Farm had chosen the historic period of uh, the 1930s, which is the Depression era. So the uh, animals that you see there for the most part would be typical of what you'd see in a 1930s farm. The Belgian draft horses, the uh, Guernsey cows, uh, Columbia Wyandotte chickens. Um, they have over time though, they've added some goats so they could do goat yoga. And I think there's still a couple of miniature donkeys there too. But um, yeah, check it out if you get a chance, Primrose Farm uh, up on Crane Road in St. Charles. Uh, I'm sure little Eleanor will be uh, available for viewing soon. So um, with that, let's take a look at um, what we've got coming up next week. Uh, we're going to uh, look at the life habits of the gray catbird. Um, we are going to find out a little bit more about uh, viburnum leaf beetles uh, appearing in Elgin and surrounding areas. That's um, it's an import, it's a European insect, and they have a taste for our native viburnum, which is um, actually quite scary. Uh, uh, caddisflies and mayflies uh, have been doing their thing for a while now. We're going to take a peek into the life history of both of those orders of insects. We're going to have a uh, report from a visitor uh, who has gone down to see the uh, brood 10 cicadas that are emerging down in central Illinois. Um, we've had some recent reports of milk snakes in the area um, and in the region. And uh, milk snakes and fox snakes can be a little bit tricky to sort out. So we're gonna take a look at what makes um, those two birds, uh, those two snakes, um, different. Um, there's actually some pretty major differences if you can get a good look at them. Um, I'm sure we'll get some reader emails um, and uh, who knows what else happens in the, uh, the wild world and wonderful world of nature. Uh, with that, I'm going to stop the share and uh, looks like we got some chats here. Um, uh, okay, so Diane wanted to know about spittle bugs in making that nest. That bubble house is solely the work of the larvae. So the adult spittle bug, um, which one uh, family of that um, super family turns into what we call frog hoppers, but I think in general, they call those adult spittle bugs frog hoppers because they, they jump, maybe you've seen leaf hoppers. Frog hoppers are a little, they're a a small insect too, but they have um, a 
it's kind of like a frog. Um, they, the adults do not make the nest. It's the, the larvae that do that. The um, adults will lay the eggs in the leaf litter, which is another reason to leave things over, um, over winter, all the plant stems that fall down and everything. Those um, spittle bug eggs are going to be down in that material and um, oh. then they'll come up and uh, start the process all over again next spring. So it's, yeah, it's only the larvae that make those nests. Uh, oh, and Mrs. Tricia, but Mrs. Tricia is in um, Kansas City. So Kansas City is a little bit ahead of us, um, phenology wise. So um, lightning bug are appearing in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, let's see. Um, so yeah, keep your eyes open because they'll be coming soon. Um, Diane also said that you were monitoring frogs. Um, oh, and you saw them too. All right, so they are here. Uh, so, all right, we will. Um, yeah, I, I was surprised because um, it was still, I can't remember the exact temperature, but it was like 65. And they were and, out flying around. And they were out, just way way out on the wetlands. I could see okay. them flashing. Um, it's great. So I was surprised because it well, was, I, it and was I early. Wonder, sometimes dryness hastens things along. Um, when we had that drought of 2012, we had one of the poorest lightning bug seasons I recall ever because they, they weren't able to even get out of the soil because it was so dry. But maybe where you were, Diane, that there, there's enough moisture, they survived, but they wanted to get out and, and get on it. Because the, the cool temperatures we've had, I would think would have suppressed their development a little bit, but that's great. Well, may, maybe out on the, because it was out in the middle of the wetlands, so maybe it's a little warmer out there. It could be. From yeah. the, the, the water and so on, so. Well, that's good though. So now we can all be on the uh, on the lookout for lightning bugs. That's great. That means summer is, well, and I heard them talking today. It is meteorological summer started today. So let the summer begin. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, let's see, any chance? Um, it was wild parsnip that the child got into even though not pictured. I don't think so, Kay, um, there is, um, it doesn't, the, the way that, that that post was tricky, and it's what irks me about social media, is that uh, put up for attention like that, and it grabs, uh, you know, people take the wrong message away, um, that what's growing at Del Nor Woods is cow parsnip. Um, some people do get a reaction to it, but the reaction, um, in fact, some of our restoration staff have had reactions to it, but they say it's not nearly as severe as some of the other, like the uh, the wild parsnip. So um, we even talked about, you know, should we put up interpretive signs? But then we thought, well, if we start, you know, describing what the reactions that you can get to different plants, you don't know what is going to happen. And we even have people, I was talking to a gentleman who said he reacts to Virginia creeper which um, often grows along with poison ivy, but he swears it was not poison ivy that gave him a rash. It was solely Virginia creeper. So in people's immune systems can be triggered by all kinds of things. So we, especially after we realized the posts had been taken down, we decided, you know, we're not going to, going to pursue that topic any further. Um, oh, Mary Alice has got uh, fireflies up in Elgin. Good for you. I guess maybe I just need to be paying more attention when I'm out at night. I'm going to take the dogs for a walk when I get home. I'll look around and see if uh, my little neighborhood has some lightning bug action. Um, okay, Greg and Kelly have the random question of a robin's nest that is now empty. Should you leave it or take it down? I would say leave it for now. Um, it, it is, if, if you're looking to, to get rid of it, I know um, my aunt was always very, um, she never liked having robins. They always nested on um, their, her downspouts and the, the grasses would hang down and she thought it looked real messy and she would always wanna take it down and always make her wait until the robins were done with it. But um, if they're officially out of it, you could remove it now, but they, conventional wisdom always said, no, they only use it once, but I've seen robins re-nest and I've also seen, um, uh, other birds, I'm trying to think of what the instance was. I think it was um, uh, 
uh, was it a house finch that reuses this? But if 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 you want to remove it, remove it now when it's not being used. Um, but if you want it to to leave it there to see if they might re-nest there, uh, robins are uh, working. Some of them are on their second broods now, um, and sometimes they do reuse it. Sometimes another robin will um, move in there. Um, I'm actually watching a, a robin's nest at my mom's house that one robin worked really hard at, but then she decided to, to not nest there because it was too uh, close to a sidewalk, I think. I think because she built it on the weekend when the sidewalk wasn't busy. And then Monday morning came and the commuters were walking to the train and the kids were walking to school. And so that nest is it's deep inside the bushes leafed out now. And I want to see if, if anything else is going to use it. But if you want to take it down, take it down. If, um, if you don't mind having it there, I, it might get used again, but it might not. Um, oh, Sarah, good anatomy connection. So cows, like baby Eleanor, uh, have three chambers in their stomach and cow parsnip. See, now this is going to stick with me. Hopefully it sticks with you guys too. Three segments on the leaves. I love it. Um, that will absolutely help. Um, I'm going to have to go through the whole cow anatomy thing every time I see the cow parsnip, but I love it. Good one. Um, oh, yeah, cow hog par uh, parsley in, in Pennsylvania, not in King County. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, uh, it's, yeah, it's just one of those things, um, so little, um, so few of the details on Facebook actually, and, and, and to tell you the truth, Laura, when you sent it to me, I, the first time I saw it, I mean, when I first glanced at it, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, what kid got into what, and why was she picking her flowers anyway? <laughs> but then, yeah, when you, when you read it more closely, you find out that it, the child wasn't even uh, around here. Eh, that's the way it goes. Um, anybody else have anything they'd like to share? Um, if not, uh, I hope you join us back again next week where we'll have all kinds of um, nature news um, to have fun with and uh, to share. So have a great rest of your week, everyone. Look for those fireflies. <laughs> See you Thanks, soon. Pam. Bye-bye. Take care. Thanks, Pam. Thanks so much, Pam. Great to see ya. Well, have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, Pam. Thanks, Pam. Bye-bye. Ah, there we go. Ah. <laughs>